Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andy Bonham, a Senior Dis Distinguished Engineer Architect at Capital One. Today we're going to talk about open source BPM and also do a comparison of uh, some of the common uh, BPM products. First, a little bit about Capital One. We are a bank that's built like a tech company. For about a decade, we've been investing in becoming a tech company, um, bringing our engineering talent in-house and building our own software solutions. Our tech team is about 11,000 people, um, and we're, we're all in on the cloud. All of our capabilities are built on AWS. We also have a pretty advanced DevOps pipeline that uh, automates a lot of the manual tasks that developers typically have to do and allows us to use a microservices architecture um, and allows our engineers to really focus on innovating and building new capabilities at the, the top of the tech stack. We're also big into open source. 2014, we made a, our first contribution as a company to open source and a declaration that we're open source first. Since then, we've released about 40 open source projects. One of the most uh, popular ones is Hygea, which is a DevOps dashboard that's used by a number of companies uh, across the country. You can see a couple others listed there. We've also uh, invested a lot of time over the years, too, in building the right culture and governance um, to have open source in a highly regulated banking industry. If you're interested to learn more about Capital One or looking for a new opportunity, definitely stop by our booth. Uh, we are hiring. There's also a link here to Capital One Tech. It's a good, good site for a lot of blogs that our uh, tech leaders write. And you can check out Capital One Careers for the openings and also follow us on Twitter. All right, so today what we're going to do is pretty much start from ground zero, uh, assuming that you don't, the audience doesn't know anything about BPM, introduce you to some of the, the key concepts and then gradually get more advanced. And in the end, the goal is for you to walk away today with a good understanding of what open source BPM is, and also some of the distinctions between some of the common products that are out there today. Real quick, a show of hands, uh, who has used uh, or, or is familiar with uh, an open source BPM product? All right, it's about half. <clears throat> cool, so some of this might be uh, repeat for some folks, other folks uh, might be might be a value. So we'll start from, from the beginning. So what is workflow? It's often a overloaded term. Um, it can mean four or five different things depending on the context that it's used in. The way I try to think of it is it, in the end it's really about indiv individual or discrete steps that are happening in a business process. And that can take the shape of three or four different forms where it could be human workflow where it's steps that you need a human to perform um, you know, investigate this case or route this application. It could be more orchestration based or system orchestration where maybe you have five APIs you need to call in a certain order and uh, it's, there really isn't any human interaction. Then it could be a combination of both where maybe it's system orchestration and then when you hit a certain condition, then you have human workflow uh, that, that executes. So. When you're talking about workflow, it's good to understand the context in, in which the term is used because it often is used uh, differently. So now that we know what workflow is, let's separate it into two different buckets, simple workflow and complex workflow. Let's first start with the basics of, you know, what are some of the characteristics of simple workflow? And at its core, task management or a to-do list is one of the common characteristics that you'll see. Users need to know, you know, what are the tasks that they need to do? and also maintain the state. What's in progress, what's not started, what's done. And then notify either them or other, other folks when certain phases are changed, either through a text message or email. And then normally simple workflow um, involves maybe only one team or division. It's not multiple groups. So it's kind of consolidated into a, a single group. Moving on to complex workflow, Often then you start and see interaction across multiple groups, multiple divisions across a company. And then the workflows start to get more complex. You have multiple levels. You have exception paths. You have callbacks where things need to route back. You can also then start and see forms of case management where it's more investigative or research-based activities that aren't 100% predictable. Um, 
They may not follow one flow, but they might follow two or three in an ad hoc or on-demand on nature. So that adds a, an element of complexity. You can also have integration with rules. So if-then logic, where you may have policies that you need to execute, um, and it could be many rules based on, on the use case. But there could be integration with either decision tables or rules engines. And then as we mentioned a little while ago, system orchestration, where you may need to, in addition to doing human workflow, also orchestrate API calls in a, in a particular order. So what is a BPM product? What problems do they solve? Um, you know, at its core, BPM stands for Business Process Management. And you'll often hear the term, uh, you'll hear several terms. You'll hear BPMS, which is Business Process uh, Management System. You may also hear iBPMS, which is an intelligent BPMS management system. Um, and at the end, really what these are is they provide a capability to model a process and also execute it. There tends to be a separate suite of products that might just focus on the modeling aspect, but the BPM products focus on the modeling and also the execution. They also take it a step further and provide integration capabilities uh, with plugins and adapters. And really what the, the problem in, in my mind that they, they address is when it's easier to um, build or code a business process in a visual model than in code. That's when these really start to um, end up in their sweet spot, is enabling a visual solution and modeling of, of a use case or a problem. And there's a, there's a ton of open source products out there. There's at least 15 or 20. Uh, you can see some of them in the, in the word cloud there. Um, so today we'll focus on like three or four of them um, that are the Apache based. But first, before we get into the actual open source products, let's talk a little bit about some of the common notation, the industry standard notation that is affiliated with a lot of these. One of the first ones is known as BPMN, which stands for Business Process Modeling Notation. And this was uh, a spec created by the Object Modeling Group and um, basically was very detailed spec that um, landed on agreement on certain icons and activities of how diagrams are built. So you can see here activities, events, gateways. These all have very specific um, uh, icons and standards that were created. And what this did is it enabled a consistent way for modeling a process. So now these uh, BPM, BPMN diagrams can be portable where you can take them and use them across multiple systems that support the specification, as long as those systems don't add their own proprietary modeling on top of it. Um, it also enables collaboration between business and tech folks, where um, you may have a business process analyst that um, can model the process, and then your, your tech folks can take that and implement it in a BPMN or BPM product. Uh, so it enables a lot of collaboration and standardization Another notation that you're, you'll hear of is decision modeling notation, or DMN. This one focuses on decisions and rules. Um, similar to BPMN, it has a flow that's followed, and then it gets to a point where a, a decision table, like in the example, is executed, um, where if certain conditions are true, um, then a result will be returned. It is compatible with BPMN, so they can be used together in a, in a process. And then moving on to the third notation, again, this one was by the object modeling group, case management modeling notation that you see there in the middle. This one focuses on cases, again, that investigative or research-based dynamic activities um, that are not really as predictable as a, as a flow. Um, and usually in the open source BPM landscape, um, the products will use one or more of these. Often it's all three or either at least two with BPMN and DMN. And we'll talk a little bit about that and uh, distinction between the products in terms of which ones they support in a little bit. But now that we, we understand what workflow is, what BPM is, some of the, the standard notation, what are some of the alternatives? Because like anything in tech, you know, one size does not fit all. There may be some cases where a BPM product may be overkill. 
Um, some of the alternatives you can explore are state machines that may not be um, as uh, detailed with the visual workflow. AWS Step Functions is one. They have a workflow studio that is a visual modeler, but does not use uh, the BPMN notation. Others are XState IO, which is a JSON-based workflow, and Netflix has a conductor project um, that can be used for orchestration. So these are other alternatives, again, if maybe you don't need all the capabilities of a BPM product, but uh, need some of the uh, orchestration and, and workflow capabilities. So when do you use a BPM product? This was a chart that I put together um, to explain to folks. And again, it, it kind of goes back to the idea that when, when you reach that point where to be able to build your process, it's easier to manage it in a visual model, that's usually a good sign that uh, you want to use a BPM product. If it's overkill to do that, then other alternatives may be a better fit. And usually that ends up in two dimensions, um, high integration and high complexity of the business process. Those are your sweet spots of where a BPM product and its capabilities can really um, help solve your problem. If you're low on the integration or low on complexity, a BPM product might be overkill. Um, and it's really up to you, know, you to evaluate your use case and to see um, you know, if you need the capabilities that are provided. And you can see in here the bullets, they're sprinkled in basically from what we covered earlier, concepts of simple workflow, which are in that lower left quadrant, and then elements of the more complex workflow are in the outer, the outer boxes. But you really have to sit down for, you know, and ask what's the problem you're trying to solve and uh, you know, make sure you're, you're selecting the right, the right solution. The other thing you need to be aware of is the monolith. Um, it's easy to build a monolith application in BPM products. Some of the products themselves, the way they're deployed, are monolithic. Um, there's a number that have been um, moving towards more of a microservice-based cloud-native architecture. Um, but this is one thing you want to you want to be aware of. And really, the idea is you want to break things into microservices, build smaller pieces that are more module, so that way you can scale those independently instead of having to scale the whole monolith. Um, so definitely something you want to keep in mind as you're you're making a decision what, what to use and how to design it. Some of the scalability things you'd want to consider, um, you know, if you do have a process, you can think about breaking it up into sub-processes um, and deploying those independently. There's also a, um, you have different options in terms of deploying some of the BPM engines. One option is to use an in-process or embedded mode where the engine itself actually runs under the JVM, same JVM as your application. Or you could run the engine as a standalone deployment where it's running as its own service and your application inter integrates with it through an API. Now both of those have their pros and cons. Um, the in-process or embedded approach uh, can have better performance because it's part of part of your application, there's not any additional network calls being made, but it does introduce coupling, right? It's tightly coupling your process engine to your application, um, and it also makes scalability a little more challenging, right? You can't just scale the engine or the application since they're embedded, you typically have to scale them both. But the standalone deployment approach, um, that approach provides an abstraction layer, so it doesn't necessarily matter what technology the application is built in, as long as it can call an API, it can integrate with the standalone deployment. You can also scale the standalone deployment separately since it is its own um, deployment. But one downside is you do have additional network calls uh, through the API. So again, those are pros and cons that you have to decide and make trade-offs on depending on your, uh, your use case. The other one that I often have folks think about is the third one around what things you should do in the BPM product versus what things you should do outside. Kind of gets, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of gets back to the monolith conversation. Throw everything in the kitchen sink inside a BPM product. You want to be selective and um, build the things in the BPM product that the BPM product is. Uh, good at, like what are its strong points? And that typically is workflow or orchestration. Um, 
I've seen teams kind of throw everything in there and then it leads to other problems later on. So you want to be very declarative about what is in the BPM, what you're going to build in the BPM product and what should stay outside. Because a lot of the BPM products have ability to integrate with external uh, either interfaces or services, which um, can help you integrate it if you do keep it externally. All right, so um, now we'll move on to the open source BPM part where we'll start and dive into some of the products. I did a little bit of research just to flag some of the key milestones in the history of open source BPM. Um, there's a lot more to this. There's you know at least 15, 20 plus products. I kind of kept it to um, you know four that spawned off of JBPM at some point, um, and that's JBPM, Activity, Comunda, and um, also Flowable. But if you look at this, it, JBPM, the first version came out in 2003, um, and wasn't until about 2010 when Activity launched, which was another open source product. And you'll notice that the first version of BPMN came out in 2004, uh, followed by the second version in 2011. Uh, Comunda forked off of Activity back in 2013. And one interesting pattern you'll see is um, a lot of these products tend to fork off of others. Um, and they may reuse some parts of the architecture, but completely, do, completely redo other parts. Um, then along, you know, the, the other two notations, CMMN and DMN, we see came out in 2014, 2015. Um, and then the next open source product came out that forked off of activ activity known as Flowable in 2017. Um, then there was a period of time where different products supported CMMN and others decided not to. Um, and then more recently in the past two years, Kajito is a new uh, refactor of the architecture with JBPM that's more geared towards making it cloud native and uh, microservice based. And Comunda also had one of their new releases this year. So one of the things that, that stays the same is that things are always changing in this la landscape. Um, so you really have to kind of see what's out there at any point in time as you're evaluating different, different products. Um, we're going to do a deeper dive now of uh, four of the, the products. And again, these at one point in time were all Apache based. Um, and one interesting graph, I, I went out there and pulled a Google trend graph. This is a graph that just shows you over time different, um, uh, the popularity of different keyword searches in Google. And you have to take this with a grain of a salt because um, you know, often other words get baked in. Comunda and JBPM are fairly unique words. Activity and Flowable had some other things, you know, get baked in there like concrete and yogurt, so you have to filter those out. Um, but it's interesting over time because it, it starts to show um, uh, just, you know, the interest in what folks are searching on. JBPM for a while was the top um, you know, search keyword followed by there was a spike when Activity came out. Um, and then activity kind of led for a while. And then around 2017, Comunda has been the more popular search term in BPMN. Um, so just, just an interesting graph. This doesn't correlate um, that I'm aware of to a number of you know, who's using it. This is more just searching searches that folks are doing on the terms in, uh, in Google. Um, so what we'll do next is start and get into the detail of each of the products. We'll look at it from three dimensions. The open source model. Um, this is very important to understand because each BPM product has a different open source model and it can be confusing to understand. So you want to make sure you understand what you're getting out of community and also enterprise in case you're trying to make that decision between one or the other. We'll also look at the capability set across some of the capabilities you see here like a rules engine, a uh, modeler, um, different deployment modes, also cloud-managed uh, services or PaaS, SaaS type, type capabilities. Then we'll take a look at the, con uh, the community activity, the contributors, the commits, how active is the project. So let's dive right in. And I'm not going to read each of these line by line, but kind of hit the highlights, and then we have a side-by-side -side comparison at the end. 
Um, we'll start with JBPM. This is one of the ones that's been around the longest, uh, around 19 years, it's Java based. It has both community and enterprise versions. Um, their open source model is fairly straightforward. Everything that's in community is in the enterprise and vice versa. Uh, typically their enterprise is about two branches behind their community because they want the, the stable um, release that's in, in, uh, in community. And <clears throat> it's fairly active, every, about every three weeks they're uh, doing releases. Some of the big things about the capability set, JBPN tends to have one of the larger capability sets. They have their own rules engine known as Drools. Um, they also support all three of the industry notations. And one thing that the JBPM project has been focus, focusing on, going back to our timeline graph since about 2020, is in this new Kajito project. And this is where they're building the refactoring of the architecture. Um, is JBPM, you know, some of the complaints over time has been it's really big, um, you know, big thing to deploy and manage. And, and this Cogito project is basically refactoring it and making it more cloud native and microservice based. They're also looking to add some capabilities around uh, reactive messaging and serverless workflow. Um, and right now they're, they're taking kind of a dual strategy of continuing the, the traditional project while also providing Kajito as a, another alternative. Moving on to Comunda, Comunda is about nine years old. They also have a com community and enterprise edition. Um, their open source model is a little different where they have their, their decision engine known as uh, ZB and then also their desktop modeler um, available in the, in the community version. Um, there's a slight nuance around source available and open source there. Um, uh, but for the most part, it is, is open source. Then there's a set of capabilities that come with the enterprise that aren't open source, but you can use in QA, uh, things that help manage the operational aspect of it. Um, Comunda supports uh, BP, MN, and DMN, um, but not C, MMN, and that was an intentional decision um, where based on community feedback a few years ago, um, a lot of the community found CMMN as being overly complex. Um, and a lot of the things you could do in BPMN in a simpler way. So based off of community feedback, they decided to drop support for that um, and uh, continue on. Some of the other key things about Comunda um, is it, uh, it supports standalone and remote deployments in version eight. Um, and, and intentionally remove the embedded deployment model. And part of that was around scaling and uh, coupling constraints where they found with the standalone remote deployment, it gives you that abstraction layer and it's easy to, easier to scale. So that again was another intentional decision that they found um, helped uh, help the community provide better solutions. The other big thing with Comunda is they do have a SaaS offering known as Comunda Cloud. It's based off of GCP. So, um, that, is, that is out there if, if that is something you're looking for. Moving on to Flowable. Flowable, again, forked off of activity about five years ago. It is, uh, they do have a community enterprise version and they have a slightly different open source model compared to the other two, where what they do is they provide um, pieces of all the different projects, but then when you go to enterprise, you get additional capabilities on top of that. So that's where it's really important to understand what are the pieces that you need for the problem you're trying to solve and understand if they're in the enterprise version or the, the open source version. Um, they do support all three industry notations. Their modeler is a little different where it, it is a plugin into Eclipse. And one thing that was interesting, there's a blog out there. Um, I have links to a lot of these in, in the notes where they recently showed how you can run the flowable engine in a AWS Lambda in a serverless approach, which is pretty cool. Moving on to activity. Um, it's 12, about 12 years old. They also have a community and enterprise, a vision, uh, enterprise uh, solution as the others. Their model is very similar to flowable where they provide the pieces in the community. And then there's additional pieces and parts you get with the enterprise. Um, they are very uh, Spring Boot cloud friendly. That's one of the uh, uh, common 
uh, pieces of feedback I get is I talk to engineers and developers that work with it. It's very easy to integrate with Spring Boot. Um, they do have a web modeler and also have an Eclipse plugin. Um, similar to Comunda, they have a uh, cloud offering. It's a uh, platform as a service known as Alfresco Cloud um, that you can use if, if you're interested in this. So you can start and see some of the nuances and the differences between the different products. Um, you know, now let's talk a little bit about the community, right? It's, it's really important with an open source project that you have an active community. Um, you want folks contributing to it, making commits. So you're not the only one that's, that's doing that, right? You want a community that you can go to for help and, and help enhance it and keep the project going on. So I pulled some of the latest commits for the four, and you can see here from the graphs, the, the activity of or the commits and contributions over the last nine years. And when you look at this, you have to kind of adjust it for the scale because um, like 20 for JBPM is a different scale than 20 for Comunda. But when I looked at this, it, 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 you know, what I came, came away from is Comunda and Flowable appear to be the two most active uh, recently in the past, at least in the past year for commits. JBPM was probably in, in third with commits. They were a little lower, but you can see from the graph, they were fairly consistent. And then activity um, seemed to have periods of being really quiet and then had a spike. Um, so I don't know if that maybe was due to the fork of flowable, but just interesting, um, kind of interesting stuff there. And then the other thing when you look at these two, um, if you go back in time for when, say, um, flowable forked off activity, if you look at like the first half of the graph, it's pretty much the same. It's because they forked off of each other. Um, so there's nuances in there that, that you can see. But it's always good to check this out on the Insights tab on GitHub when you're you know, trying to figure out if, if you want to use it. Definitely want an active community. Um, this chart is pretty much just summarizes what I had already hit the highlights on uh, across the four. Um, again, this is my kind of perspective after doing some research. JVPM had the largest capability set, which could be a pro or a con based on the problem you're trying to solve. Um, you know, there's differences between uh, the capabilities around embedded mode and, and modeler and support for a CMMN. And again, a lot of differences between the open source uh, models of each of these. Um, so anyway, what I would say is if you're trying to figure out which one to use, like understand how they're different and then try to find the one that matches your company's principles and uh, best practices um, to help you, help you move forward. Uh, put up here a couple of blogs we've written over the years. Um, we actually did this, last did this comparison about six years ago. And uh, when I was putting this together, I was kind of amazed at how much has changed since then. Um, but a lot of other interesting articles out here, if, if you're interested, these are all on that Capital One uh, tech site, a bunch of others that my colleagues have written. Um, do stop by the Capital One booth um, if you're interested. We also have a networking event later tonight um, that you can learn more about. Um, so happy to chat more about this. Um, and with that, I think we'll take any questions. Sure. So the question was, what is the what are the use cases where BPM can be a fit for, um, like CI/CD project management? Um, uh, it's a good question. It can. I mean, there's no limits to what it can be applied to um, that fit into the workflow realm. I've I've seen it used in CI/CD processes. Um, uh, uh, there's, a, there's a wide spectrum of problems it can solve. Um, you know, I, I would think of it more of, um, you know, from the dimensions of human workflow and also process orchestration are two places where it, it can help. Call center. Call center, yep. Absolutely. Yeah, 
Yeah, that's, um, uh, so the question is, uh, what are the web forms for each of the products? Yeah, those are, if you think of, um, uh, if we go back, let's see here, did I have forms called out? I don't think I did. Um, if, we, if you think of like data entry for a workflow where say a person gets a task that they need to complete and they need to either put in some notes or um, add in some other things, a lot of these tools will automatically generate a UI based off of the data attributes. Um, some of them are, are fairly, uh, I mean, it's not a fancy UI, uh, you know, they're very basic, but it could be a quick way to generate something that you can get out into production for, for data entry. A lot of um, use cases I've seen is uh, teams will go out and build their own UI and you know, more modern technologies, uh, like you know, Angular, um, you know, forms of you know, JavaScript or React, Vue, and, and basically interact with the engine through an API. Well, so the question is, is are any of these more cloud native, um, like Kubernetes based? Um, when I looked at, when I did the recent research, um, Comunda and Flowable have built out support for Kubernetes um, along with activity. Um, so that, that seems to be a common, a common thread that they're moving towards where you can deploy it. Um, JBPM in their Cogito project is also moving towards Kubernetes. I know um, in the traditional project, they had a way where you could deploy it in a Docker container, but it was literally the whole application. Yeah. Um, so I don't, I don't know that I would call that cloud native. You know, you want to, you want to split up into, you know, services and have multiple Docker containers, but I think they're evolving over time. We use a host of, um, of several of these. Um, and to the other, uh, oh, the question was what products we use at Capital One. I always forget to repeat the question, sorry. Um, it, uh, so we use, we use a mix of these. Um, and it's across a range of use cases to the other question. You know, there, there's a wide spectrum of, of use cases it can apply to. Um, and I, I've seen them used in kind of both, actually all three dimensions of human work, workflow, process orchestration, and a combination of both. Sure. Yeah, great question. So the question is, um, in Capital One, what has been our experience with building rules in a reusable way? Um, that is a great question. And <laughs> over, uh, over time, um, you know, I, I think we've, we've learned along the way, you know, like everyone else where you do it the wrong way and you fail and you learn you know, how to do it the right way. Um, you know, things as simple as naming conventions, having a rule repository, having a way to discover things. Like, it's one of the foundational things, right? To be able to reuse anything, you have to be able to find what's already there. And if it's not easy to find, folks aren't gonna use it. They're gonna build something else and then duplicate it. So you, you often, some of those basic things you have to solve for, and then um, uh, things like drools do have a rules repository that integrates with Git, so you can store your rules and get it on the back end. Um, All right.
Any other questions? Good question. So the question is, um, at Capital One, do we have any of these products that are used as um, like an internal service for other divisions to use, or is it more embedded? Um, and uh, I've seen both, where in some cases teams will embed it because their use case was a little simpler and um, they didn't need to serve like multiple applications. But then we have others where maybe they needed to serve an entire division. So they used more of the standalone approach and you know, leveraged the API so multiple applications could, could reuse the same, um, you know, same deployment. Uh, good question. So any, is there any product that's better with the shareable or the embedded? Um, you know, I think uh, some of the experience we've had with um, uh, definitely activity or Spring Boot developers, uh, that was a plus. They felt it was really easy to integrate with Spring Boot. Um, and, uh, but the embedded can be done with, you know, uh, with JBPM or, you know, the older versions of Commanda. Uh, it was version 8 that I believe it moved to just the, re the remote or standalone. Um, but that's, that get to your question kind of gets back to that point of um, how modular, you know, is the application? Like, is it one big library or is it broken out into smaller libraries and all you need is like one library to include? Um, so each of those is a little different on, in terms of you know, how modular the components are. Uh, they do have a web modeler, to my understanding. Okay. Um, I'll need to come into the folks to check me on this, but I think it's only available in their SaaS deployment. Um, but that was my, my understanding. All right. Any other questions? Think of anything, feel free to uh, stop by our booth and uh, we'll be hanging out there. If not, uh, thank you for your time and, and the discussion.